Hi gamers, welcome back to the One Block of Bedrock survival series, where we go from one block of bedrock in vanilla-ish Minecraft to finally having a zombie villager chasing us down. I mean, I say finally, but this guy did turn up within about 10 seconds of when I was going to end last episode. So we got a little lucky there. Nothing too insane though, because these guys are actually fairly common. There's about a 1 in 20 chance that any pack of zombies that spawn in will spawn in as a single zombie villager. That means we're going to be seeing quite a few of these guys spawn in this episode, even if the mob farm is a little nerfed by Conway's game of life. Ah, what a fun time that was. Anyway, to cure this guy, we're going to need a splash potion of weakness. The recipe for this thing is fairly simple, and we have all the ingredients lying around. First we fill up a brewing stand with some water, then chuck in some nether warts and blaze powder to make ourselves a strength potion. Then we use a fermented spider rice to invert the recipe, and... Oh, that's not how you make a weakness potion. Let's try again. The actual recipe for a weakness potion is literally just a fermented spider eye, plus some gunpowder to make it a splash potion. Okay, there we go. Now it's time to cure our first zombie villager. Nice. Okay, this guy's going to take about 20 minutes to do his thing and convert into a normal villager, and in that time I've got a few cool things to mention. First of all, remember that one block of grass video I made, where, you know, I theorized how it would be possible to, you know the video. Well, someone is doing that exact challenge for real. And I'm not talking about the cheesy tactic I used, where I went to some old ass version of Minecraft to get myself an end portal. Nope, they are doing it completely in the latest version of Minecraft. No starting items, and no mods that'll change the order of progression. There's a couple of cool additions to make the late game more interesting, but otherwise it's a pretty faithful recreation of the utter insanity involved with going from one block of grass. If you want to check out the series yourself and see it all come to life, there is a link in the description. The other cool thing I want to mention is that you can now play through this one block of bedrock challenge yourself using a custom map by Lithound. Lithound reached out to me to share a custom data pack inspired by the series, and after I mentioned that the series doesn't have an official map, they offered to develop something. So massive thanks, and if you're keen to try out their map, or do this whole bedrock challenge yourself, there are some links in the description. Alright, now that I've plugged some cool stuff, I guess we can check in on our zombie villager friend. Oh hey, nice timing. Our guy is finally ready to trade with us. But before we do that, I'm going to throw a few loaves of bread his way. I think he might be at half a heart because he fell from the top of the mob farm back when he was a zombie. It's possible that he would have healed to full HP when he got converted into a villager, but I don't really feel like testing it at the moment, since if I kill this guy, I'll have to go looking for another golden apple. Something else we have to be really careful about is which trays we unlock for this villager. At the novice rank, we really want to be getting a potato and carrot trade, since it's by far the easiest one to farm for emeralds. Then once we have that going, we can use our tiny little farm, plus a decent amount of bone meal, to give ourselves a steady source of emeralds. But a steady source of emeralds isn't the main reason we chose the farmer as our first villager. Once we get this farmer to the apprentice rank by selling him enough potatoes and carrots, he'll start to sell us apples. And if you saw me almost die several times last episode, you'll kind of understand why I'm so keen to get a bunch of apples off this villager. There is one slight issue though when it comes to unlocking the apple trade. When the villager reaches the apprentice rank, there are three possible trades that it can unlock, and the villager will only unlock two of them. Basically, there is only a two in three chance that the villager will actually decide to start selling us apples instead of something else randomly. If we roll badly on this villager, and he decides not to sell us apples, then we'll have to go on another nether expedition to get ourselves another golden apple. Or we could just exploit the multiverse. I'm going to make a few copies of my world before he levels up. That way, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get a golden apple off this guy. Sure, it's a little bit cheaty, but we've already crossed this line in the past. Anyway, I'm back in the main parallel dimension to see if this guy is going to sell us an apple. And it looks like he is. Nice. Now that we can easily make golden apples, it's just a matter of waiting for more zombie villagers to turn up. In the meantime, I've got a few side projects that I need to put some time into. The first thing I do is make a whole bunch of new dirt so that I can make a farm for this villager to work on. I know, I know, this method is actually not the best way of getting dirt. 
One of you guys commented last episode saying that I could easily make coarse dirt by combining dirt with gravel. And I didn't know this while I was recording, so just excuse me for doing it the dumb way. At least I'll be able to make some good use of this wood soon. The dirt I just harvested will eventually go towards a villager farm, but for now it's just going to go towards making a really good supply of carrots. While I was doing this, I checked in on the mob farm a few times to see if any zombie villagers had turned up. But the mob farm spawn rate was pretty terrible and I couldn't really find any. So maybe it's time to do something about Conway's game of life. Another great suggestion you guys gave last episode was to throw some lava down to prevent Conway's game of life from spawning in any mobs. With the way Conway's game of life is laid out, we should be able to do this with just two buckets of lava, one on each side. Then the lava can spread down and cascade across all of the blocks until most of them are covered. The remaining ones should be bright enough that no mobs will spawn on them. Now there is a slight risk that any water I spill could make Conway's game of life double in size, so I guess I'll have to be really really careful. Anyway, for the next little while I tended to the farms, jumped around the base for a bit, and waited at the bottom of the mob farm for any zombie villagers to turn up. And unfortunately nothing was spawning. Even with Conway's game of life patched up a bit, this mob farm wasn't producing mobs very quickly. So I guess it's time to finally use my stairs to make some improvements on the mob farm. I built these stairs back in episode 3 because I was planning on doing some maintenance on the mob farm to make the spawn rates a bit more efficient. But I guess I just never got around to it. And now, 3 episodes later, I'm once again also not going to get around to it. Because there's a zombie villager right there. I'm going to try and lure this guy down onto these stairs so I don't have to deal with him almost dying of full damage. And speaking of almost dying of full damage, it's a really good thing I have Elytra. Okay, I guess it's time to greet our zombie friends as they're coming down. Not you though, regular zombie. No one cares about you. Alright, now it's time to put the zombie villager away for the rest of its life. Oh, and it also looks like there's another zombie villager that fell down the mob chute. We'll get to him soon, but first let's make things a little safe around here. Then we can pick up all the other mobs nearby and make a little hole for this guy to get out. Now let's make a little home for this guy too. In fact, if we put him right next to the other villager, we can cure both of them with just one splash potion of weakness. Nice. Now we can go away for 20 minutes, and by the time we're back, these guys will be upstanding members of society. For these next two villagers, I have a bit more freedom in terms of what I can make them into. These ones are going to be a cleric and an armorer. The cleric is going to be able to give me lapis lazuli so I can enchant my stuff, plus he'll buy all of my rotten flesh and gold at a pretty decent price. Meanwhile the armorer will give me a nice opportunity to use up all my emeralds on stuff I don't need. Eventually though, once the armorer reaches the final two ranks, they'll start to sell us full enchanted diamond gear. For a pretty good price of one emerald. Yeah, training with villagers who have been converted from zombies is pretty overpowered. The armor pieces being sold here are already enchanted too, which is actually kind of annoying because the enchants tend to suck. That's why I built this little grindstone to remove the enchants and have another go for it myself. The first item I actually enchanted was a bow. And I'd say I got pretty lucky on this one. Really lucky. This is the best possible enchant you can get from an enchanting table, and it's just one power rank off being perfect. Now some people are going to say that mending is a better enchant to have on a bow than infinity, but those people are wrong and you should stop listening to them. Oh, and while I was going through all of these cool enchants, I managed to get the cleric up to master rank. So now he'll be able to sell me even more stuff I don't need, like bottles of enchanting. Okay, now that we've exploited the first three villagers for everything good they sell, I think it might be time to unlock a few more trades. Since we now have more than one villager, we can start breeding these guys together to make some more. The homegrown villagers won't be as lucrative as the ones we've cured, but they'll make it way easier to unlock a bunch of the items that we don't really need to trade for regularly. I'm going to be building a villager breeder based on a design by Logical Geek Boy. The main difference between what I'm going to build and what he showed off in the video 
is that I'm going to use water streams instead of minecarts to move the villagers around. I'm a bit short on iron at the moment, so making a bunch of minecarts and minecart tracks isn't the best idea. Maybe once I've got these villagers going, I'll be able to make an iron golem farm and gain access to infinite iron. But that's not happening anytime soon. For now, I'm just going to remove the lava from Conway's Game of Life, so later on when we start building stuff, it's not going to be a massive issue if we spill water everywhere. Um, uh oh. <laughs> I got rid of the lava at the top, but there's still lava trickling its way down. Okay, let's have a look at the damage. I'm just messing with you guys, it was completely fine. But that could have been really bad if the water spills in another direction. Yeah, that water's not touching anything. Okay, now that we can safely spill water, I guess it's time to start the build montage. And we're back. Looks like these guys have settled in nicely. I did kind of forget to fill the entire area with carrots though, so I'm going to help out with some bone meal while I can. Once these guys build up a good supply of food in their inventory, they're going to start to reproduce. And when that happens, like now for example, we have to look away or else they'll get really embarrassed and not make kids. I mean, that's fair enough, let's give them some space. Alright, the villagers have done their thing, and if you look really closely, you can see the first baby villager. When this guy grows up, he's going to be tall enough to fit into this water stream, and that water stream is going to take him up into this holding area up top. From there, I can open any of these trapdoors to drop him into one of these booths. I think for this first villager, I'm going to try and turn him into a farmer, so I can have two farmers working in the farm. After that, I'm going to turn my next villager into a librarian. Mainly because I really want a mending book for my elytra, but also because the paper trade is a great way to make money. Now, slight issue with that is that we won't be able to do the paper trade until we buy sugarcane from the wandering trader. But since the last time we tried to get the wandering trader in, something pretty important has changed. 
We've gained access to the bell from a trade by the armorer. And the bell is a pretty important part of most wandering trader farms. Whenever a wandering trader spawns in, it'll check in a 48 by 48 block area to see if there are any bells nearby. And if there is one, it'll start walking towards it. So if we put a bell in the center of our wandering trader farm, then every single wandering trader that spawns there is going to try and pathfind towards the center and fall into a nether portal. Now, the most annoying part of building any wandering trader farm is filling in the massive area that surrounds this little pitfall in the middle. The maximum spawn rate happens when you have a 96 by 96 block area to spawn them in on. But going with something that big isn't really worth it. The wandering trader spawn system checks in a 96 by 96 area 10 separate times to see if there's somewhere to spawn. So if your farm is half the area, like 48 by 96, then your chances of missing 10 times in a row are 0.5 to the power of 10, or about 1 in 1000. I graphed it out back in episode 3, and you can easily see that doing a wandering trader farm at the maximum size is absolutely not worth it. But that didn't stop me. You see, I had an idea in mind that would be able to make me a wandering trader farm of any size I wanted. An idea inspired by Conway's game of life. By layering lava flows on top of water flows on top of lava flows, you can make what's called a lava cast. And if you've ever seen screenshots or renders of the 2b2t map, you'll probably recognize some of these formations. There's a bunch of different types of lava cast, and I did some experimentation in a creative world to see which one would suit me best. I experimented a bit with simple pyramid shapes, and even this concave bowl that would somehow filter the villagers towards the center, but the design I ended up going with was this pyramid here with a very shallow gradient. The idea behind this one is that if you want to get lava to flow as far away as possible, then you can go out 3 blocks for every 1 block you go down. So, if you make a pyramid designed around the maximum flow distance of lava, then you can get an area that's pretty decent to sprint around on, while also being incredibly easy to build without bringing too much lava with you. So, I platformed out a couple hundred blocks and got to work. You'll see early on I make a few mistakes and have to do a little bit of repairs manually. It's okay for me to make mistakes now, but later on when the layers consist of thousands of blocks, making a mistake then can be absolutely devastating. The worst one of all is when you place the water too soon and the lava hasn't had time to spread out across the entire structure. I did this a few times in my creative practice world, but luckily I was able to avoid it while I was doing the actual build. If I did make this mistake though, the time it would take to clean everything up could potentially take as long as it would to build a wandering trader farm from scratch using normal methods. So I have to be really careful when I'm building this thing. The most important thing is to wait until the lava reaches all the way down to the edge before you drop the water bucket. If you're feeling brave, you can do it a little bit before that, but the consequences of messing up this timing are really really bad. Next up, you need to break the top piece of cobblestone, and then rescue the piece of lava you used for the previous layer. I messed this up a few times, and ended up with 6 blocks of obsidian by the time I was done. Luckily, I packed a lot of lava for each trip, so I only had to refill once. And now comes my first minor screw up when I was building this thing. It's only a tiny little pallet of lava, but it was able to create quite a few blocks of cobblestone. You can probably imagine what would happen if I were to do a bigger spill, with a lot more lava and a lot more water. In fact, I'm about to do it quite soon. Yeah, this one was a bit of a pain to clean up, but honestly I was expecting it to be way worse. And it kind of raises the question of, if it's so risky doing this lava casting method to build stuff, is it a good way to build things? And the answer is that it's absolutely terrible, please don't do this, this is so bad. Like, you're about to see me do this final one in real time, and it's gonna take like half a minute for the water to go all the way down to the bottom. And water moves at like 6 times the speed that lava does. So imagine 3 minutes for every time you want to make a layer of lava go down. And the fun part is, we did this from the bottom of the world. Not y equals 0, but y equals negative 64 because the world's big now. If you include the time I spent designing and planning, then this lava cast monstrosity took four and a half hours. There is no way that this could ever be seen as a good way of doing it. You could build five wandering trader farms in the same time that I took to build this one thing, and your wandering trader farms wouldn't be misshapen. Ah, oh, this thing took a lot out of me. 
but to be fair, it looks pretty cool, and I'm sure the time lapse was a lot more pleasant than the actual build process was. Anyway, now that my rant's over, it's time to turn this thing into a real wandering trader farm. That means I'll need to build a little area in the middle where the wandering traders can fall into a bunch of nether portals. I'll also need a way of tricking them to fall down the blocks, so I built this little trapdoor and iron bar contraption that should trick them into thinking it's a solid block. Then we'll add a bell to the middle so the wandering traders have something to walk towards. They don't actually need to see it to walk towards it, but I think it looks kind of nice being visible from the entire structure. And then finally, we need to light up the entire place so no hostile mobs will spawn. You'd probably think this would be the hardest part, but honestly it wasn't so bad. You see, in Minecraft, light spreads in a rhombus shape. And this entire villager farm is also a rhombus shape. So you can pretty easily tile a bunch of torches all over the place, and get a nice even pattern that lights up the entire place with at least a light level of 1 on every single block. And it even looks kinda nice. I'm pretty happy with the way this farm turned out to be honest, even if it was a massive waste of time compared to if I built a normal farm. Oh, and while I was building this farm, I managed to get a single wandering trader to spawn. This guy didn't walk towards the bell in the centre, but I think that's because he was more than 48 blocks away. That doesn't mean that the farm is badly designed or anything, although it is badly designed, but it just means that I'll have to stand in the centre if I want to go AFK here. Anyway, this villager was selling sand, so I decided to get some, and if I need more, I can just duplicate it somehow. So, yeah. That is the Wandering Trader Farm in action. I mean, it hasn't actually worked properly yet, since that villager was too far away from the centre, but I'm sure by the time next episode comes out, we will have got a bunch of villagers dropping into here. But yeah, that's something we'll have to wait until next episode to find out about. Speaking of next episode, I've got some really cool things in mind, but it might also be the last one in the series. It's been incredibly fun playing through this challenge, and I've loved the response you guys have given to the channel over the past year. But even still, I think it might be time to move on soon, since we've unlocked most of the cool stuff we've been trying to in this challenge. I'm still open to playing this map in live streams and stuff like that, but in terms of where I'm going to spend my editing time, I've got some ideas that aren't related to Minecraft and I hope you look forward to them. So yeah, thank you for watching and I will see you next time.